morning, everyone. Welcome to our first session for today. So uh, we all know how uh, HTTP conf is very important for all web developers over here. So we have a new HTTP 2.4, and we have Jim here, one of the co-founders of ASF, speaking about the same. Let's all welcome it with a huge round of applause. Thank you. Check, check. Move this up a little bit higher. One, two. That's, is that good enough? Everyone hear me OK? OK, perfect, great. Good morning, everyone. As, as uh, the introduction uh, mentioned, uh, thank you for the very, very first uh, uh, session for this, uh, this ApacheCon. Really looking forward to this ApacheCon. It's going to be a really, really fantastic one. Um, we're a small enough group that I think that um, we can you know, go ahead with like, you know, a Q&A during the actual session itself. So if I'm going through something and um, it's not clear or you have some questions or something like that, just raise your hand. Um, I'll repeat the question for recording purposes and stuff like that. I will try to set up time towards the very, very end for 10 minutes of formal Q&A, but I don't want to uh, restrict us to, restrict us to that. Um, by a quick show of hands, how many people are currently using uh, Apache HTTPD, any version at all? Okay, great. Uh, how many people are using uh, 2.2 or, uh, you know, older, like 2.0, Okay, how many people are using 2.4? Okay, great. So, um, and how many people are using different, uh, you know, web servers out there and stuff like that? Okay, great, fantastic. So, got a good mix of people in here, so it should be a really, really good conversation. Um, you know, a little bit about me, let's move back a little bit. I wear a lot of hats at Apache, but the big thing for me uh, and for you today is the very fact that I am a co-developer of the Apache, uh, the Apache web server. Um, to pay the bills, I'm lucky enough to work for a company called Red Hat, you may have heard of as a consulting engineer in their open uh, source and standards team. And if you wish to follow me on Twitter, that's my uh, Twitter tag right there. Um, now, a lot of people are kind of like wondering, you know, why worry about HTTPD? Um, after all, uh, especially if you look at the Netcraft, uh, you know, surveys, they are really, really excited about seeing, you know, the Apache kind of like dwindle down in the overall survey numbers. You know, you look at the more realistic and more meaningful numbers, and Apache's still doing very, very greatly. Um, some of the things you start hearing about. First of all, you know, Apache is so old school, and there's a great uh, YouTube video I refer you to. Um, by the way, all my slides are going to be on SlideShare later on, so you'll have access to all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Apache doesn't scale. Well, that's not really, really true. We have a couple slides to, to show about that. Also, that Apache is too generalized. You know, what we need is a more specific, more, uh, you know, focused web server out there. Well, um, there certainly are use cases for generalized um, uh, web servers as well as specialized web servers. Um, you know, looking at the, the natural world, certainly uh, a, uh, an animal, a beast such as man, which is much more generalized, I think is a more successful entity than something like a lion, which is much more specific. Uh, Apache is too complex, the config file. My response to that is, if that's your, your major complaint, really, you need to get a life. Um, and finally, Apache is too old. Well, yeah, Linux is old too, and just because something is old doesn't mean it's not useful. I mean, look at me, I still have some uses. Um, so when we were going from 2.2 to 2.4, we had a couple things that we really wanted this next generation of Apache to worry about. So these were the main design drivers. These were the things that were um, basically in the back of our mind. And these are the things we wanted to address with this particular version of Apache. First of all, because backwards compatibility is very, very important to us because HTTPD is so entrenched out there. We wanted to add new features and improve, uh, you know, uh, improve the old ones without making life difficult for people who are making that transition up there. So that was one of the major things. Another thing that was very important to us was because of the lessons learned from you know, uh, web servers out there and caching servers which used asynchronous event-based uh, mechanisms. We realized that Apache HTTP 2.4 needed to improve our capability for doing that. So it was important that we, uh, we added um, that kind of capability, uh, but again, in a design way that if you were still using, for whatever reasons, for example, pre-fork, 
that you still had that option available to you. That, you know, we didn't drop an old NPM out there simply to make it easier to add another one in, inside there as well. And so we were talking about the, you know, the larger usable of, uh, of NPMs out there. Uh, we added uh, the event NPM, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, doing something which is much more uh, simple. It's called the simple uh, NPM, much more uh, laid back, much more uh, focused, much easier to use and develop from a developer standpoint, but also avoids a lot of the bottlenecks and stuff like that in traditional NPMs. Um, also, it's very, very important is that um, in a lot of ways, uh, HTTP is lucky enough to leverage the development being done on the Apache Portable Runtime Library which is sort of like the interface between the Apache web server itself and the underlying operating system. So Apache itself, for example, doesn't need to worry about things like, uh, you know, large files or how to, uh, you know, access, uh, you know, a uh, send file or something like that. Things that you would want uh, a web server to worry about, you just interface that through APR. APR knows about that, okay? And Apache is able to gain those benefits pretty much transparently. So we wanted to definitely make sure that all the advances that were going on inside of APR, we leveraged and used as much as we could. Uh, finally, we also needed to, to increase performance. You know, uh, that's an obvious thing. Reduce memory utilization. And of course, the, uh, the big design driver was the cloud and all the impacts and influence that the cloud, cloud-based architectures, cloud de design drivers would feed back into the design and development of the Apache web server itself. So with these things in mind, we sort of like had an idea of what we wanted Apache 2.4 to kind of like look like. So the four main topics that I'll be talking about today will be, uh, first of all, the performance increases that uh, are available in, in Apache 2.4 uh, right now. Uh, then we'll be talking about the configuration, the runtime improvements, things that, you know, if you are, you know, uh, one of those sad, sad people who have sysadmin, you know, next to their name, we make life easier for you by doing things and adding features that you would like to have and have been clamoring for for a long period of time. Uh, obviously, because we're going from 2.2 to 2.4, there are a whole bunch of new, uh, new cool stuff added into, in there as well, and we're talking about that. And then finally, the, uh, the improvements um, that are inside of Apache HTTPD because of the cloud and a lot of talk about the other proxy server, because in a lot of cases, especially in cloud environments, uh, your web server, especially at Apache itself, is the front end to a whole bunch of back end services. And so we'll talk about those things. So looking at performance, for example, um, the event NPM, which was added in 2.2, Apache 2.2, uh, which initially started off as just a way of handling uh, keep alives better. And we'll go into a lot of detail about that, but the idea behind it is that you would have a socket, it is just send information to the client. Um, you're in this keep alive uh, routine now, basically waiting for the next request come on, on the exact same socket. Uh, the event NPM was originally designed to say, here's a socket, put it into a queue and wait for some kind of event to happen on that queue. Instead of, that, instead of having a, a process or a thread dedicated to listening. So it kind of like was that first transition from, you know, a process or thread being totally focused on a request, request, request a response cycle to a more event driven. Um, and so the event NPM uh, with those simple, uh, humble beginnings has really evolved to something which is much more event based. So the, so the, uh, the information on the sockets are really event driven. So we have a big queue of, of sockets available out there and Apache is smart enough to figure out, okay, is the socket readable? Is the socket writable? And use things like that. You know, much more similar to the traditional event-based systems such as Nginx and things like that. Um, we did use, um, you know, the, uh, the latest versions of Apache uh, Portable Runtime. In fact, the latest versions of Apache 2.4 for full capability require the 1.5 versions of APR. Uh, we actually did that uh, during a, I think it was like 2.4.6 to 2.4.7 248 time frame, which is not really the best time to do it, but um, you know, one of it had to do with a, uh, a data structure, something called a skip list that was added into the event NPM to make it much more efficient and stuff like that. 
Um, we also um, were able to really reduce a lot of the bloat inside of Apache itself. So Apache itself is able to run with a much smaller memory footprint. So if you're using Apache on, WA, on AWS or something like that, you can get by with a smaller you know, uh, cloud uh, uh, instance than, uh, than you would be, you know, normally have to be able to. And as I said before, we do have some more uh, efficient data structures and stuff like that inside of it. So those are the, the, the main issues that we were talking about. But let's talk about how this happened. Um, what this did to the actual uh, response of Apache. And I actually did a more um, in-depth uh, session about this uh, a few years ago. And there's a link to that also on, on the slide share. But right here we're looking at, at basically the, um, the interaction between uh, Nginx and Apache 2 for the event NPM. And we're looking at things like how long it takes the entire process, request, response, to open a socket, to write, to read, and to close it. So if you want to look at the total request response time frame for a request to come in with increasing levels of concurrency, you would basically look at the, uh, the red issues, the red lines right there. That tells you how long the request response, uh, request response time frame would take. And in general, you'll see that, you know, at least for the, uh, the levels of concurrency that we're talking about right here, um, the, uh, the event NPM matches the, uh, the capability of, uh, of Nginx very, very well. Now, certainly there are use cases where the number of concurrency is like out in the hallway someplace that Apache will start falling down and stuff like that, but maybe that's not an issue right now with the cloud, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But you can see there has been some substantial improvements, especially with the event NPM, uh, with Apache 2.4. In fact, for most um, operating systems out there right now, the event NPM is the, uh, is the default NPM that we're using and we're recommending people to use. This is just a, another different way of looking at the same, uh, same information there, right there, but we're seeing that um, we're comparing uh, the different uh, NPMs right here. You see, for example, uh, you know, pre-fork, worker, event, and Nginx, and you're looking at the basically performance right there. And it's kind of, kind of hard to see. You see, one of the interesting things is that the pre-fork, even though it's a very, very heavy NPM, you know, it, it utilizes a lot of resources, um, the, the, the level of consistency as far as, you know, the request response time frame uh, for the web server is incredibly consistent. There's not a lot of uh, latency involved inside there and stuff like that. Of course, you're paying for it because it is a much more heavy weight. But if you're looking at, you know, trying to compare apples to apples, you know, the event Nginx, you're seeing that they're very much, uh, very much similar out there. Just another uh, 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 chart that also shows that these were the charts that I did using a whole bunch of different kinds of, of um, uh, benchmarks and things like that. And again, you're seeing uh, pre-fork much more consistent um, as you go up, you know, some, uh, some more uh, inc inconsistency out there, but you're seeing that again, Apache can really, really hold its own for the levels of, of concurrency that we, uh, we talked about. Uh, since I did these, um, these benchmarks, uh, there might be some uh, suspicion that maybe, yes? Uh, the question was, on the previous slide, what was the maximum level of concurrency? And I cannot remember what that is, I have it in my notes, and I have, it, I have that more in the, um, in the previous one that I did that's on SlideShare. I think it's called um, the Cloud Killer or something like that. There is uh, 100 to, to 10,000, but um, I'm not exactly sure if that's, uh, if that's correct or not. Uh, this is a, uh, an independent benchmark that was actually posted on the uh, HTTPD uh, dev list, and you'll see that um, you know, right here, they actually has the, uh, uh, the conditions that he's, that he's using, um, you know, the, the, the setup as well. Uh, there's uh, the URL to it. And you can see that, again, in a lot of cases, you're seeing uh, the event NPM and Nginx, you know, work, uh, work very, very well. The reason why I, I, we mention Nginx is because it is most probably the one that most people are interested in. It's the, you know, when you're talking about Apache, you talk about Nginx. When you talk about Nginx, you talk about Apache. Um, you know, not saying that Apache is perfect for everything, but we are sensitive to the very fact that uh, performance needs to be increased 
Um, and so we're, certainly we're working with that. If you need something which will kick the barn doors off, then Nginx, traffic server, other things are, again, very, very good and, and are viable, extremely viable and stable alternatives. So that was the uh, looking at the performance aspects uh, of 2.4. Now let's talk about some of the new features as far as the configuration uh, of runtime. Um, and most of these are things that may not be interesting to everyone, but I am sure that these are things that make someone in someone's life in this room much more happy. For example, uh, a much finer control resolution of timeouts, whereas before they were just uh, up, uh, you know, with second resolution, now we're up to milliseconds. You can actually also determine things such as uh, as the requests come in, it's not just how long does it take for a request, there are different phases within that request uh, cycle. And you're able to uh, control and have fine tuning over how long to wait for you know, a, a ping over the socket, a request response and things like that. So this enables you to, if you are running into uh, you know, uh, uh, issues with people trying to do a, a slow leaking request to Apache, you can just say, I'm only going to wait for, you know, 300 milliseconds, you know, after the first byte of data coming in, you know, for the second byte, you know, they're obviously not doing something right. I'm going to go and, and um, you know, uh, drop that connection or whatever. Also, uh, we have much finer control over logging. Uh, logging still is most probably the most beneficial way of finding out what's going on in your, um, in your web server. Uh, and Obviously, you know, the access log is what people look at for stats and stuff like that, but your error log is, is certainly your, your, big, uh, your big friend, and there is a, a session later on today which goes into debugging Apache and stuff like that. The problem is, is that it used to be that uh, with 2.2 uh, with and, and earlier, it was almost like an all or nothing. You know, if, if you had problems, Apache would either be very, very silent or extremely verbose. This allows you to say, okay, just for this particular module, just for SSL module or something like that, that's where I want you to be very, very verbose. For everything else, be kind of quiet, be kind of, kind of silent. With this one, please be much more verbose about it so I can tell what's going on inside there. And for uh, module, or, uh, module uh, developers, we actually have uh, you know, log levels even more um, uh, underneath the debug level. We're actually tracing how Apache is, is doing uh, the internal processing and stuff like that. Uh, now, obviously, you don't want to do that in production environments, but again, if you need uh, more detailed information that the debug log level, uh, you know, is not giving you, then this allows you to, uh, to do that. And right here, we have just a little code snippet right here about how to, how to do that. Another thing which is very, very cool um, and I, I got a, a plug for a, a later on session about here, so I won't go into a lot of detail about these, is the, um, there's a new configuration runtime called IF, which allows you to change how Apache is, is uh, you know, responding to a request inside the config file itself. So you don't need to worry about creating a particular handler that says, okay, if this is going on. This is actually does uh, within the config file. So right here you're seeing that if the, re, uh, if the host coming in is actually, you know, from example.com, then you're going to redirect it to someplace else. You have full uh, else-if capability as well. So if it's coming in from a different one, you have, you know, uh, named virtual host and it's coming in from a different one, you're redirecting it to someone else. This is in the config file. It's not in any kind of code or anything like that. So it enables uh, you as the administrator to have much more flexibility in doing that. Now, of course, you could have done this back in the old days with mod rewrite, but as we all know, mod rewrite is very complex. It's a very, very heavy module. It's the Swiss Army knife that actually has a big butcher's knife on the end of it. And unless you open it up correctly, you're going to get stabbed and you're not going to have fun. So uh, making this kind of capability in the config file without having to worry about mod rewrite is very, very cool. Another thing that was very, very difficult for a lot of people to understand, and myself even included, I would always figure out, allow, deny, which one goes first, which one goes second, how does it go? Well, the required uh, uh, directive had now been very, very simplified. You're basically just saying, I just want to have this particular person or this particular group, you know, uh, have access to this IP. It uh, enables the creation of sensical uh, access control lists without worrying about the intrinsic keys of what is allow, what is deny. You're basically just saying, we want to require anyone coming in 
to either be in a particular group, from a particular IP address, from a particular domain name, whatever particular parameter you want, the require makes that much more, simpl uh, much more uh, simplified for you. It makes things a lot easier to, to understand. Uh, in a lot of cases, you, just, you run into cases where um, you know, people are, are trying to, and they're trying to figure out why am I not getting access to not, why am I getting access to night on this? And it's because, you know, the ACLs inside there are kind of like nebulous or, or you know, uh, unstructured. And this really allows you to uh, have a much more cohesive way of, of looking at it. Another thing which is very cool is that you're able to, again, from the configuration file, have uh, configuration file directives uh, and, and definitions and variables in a very, uh, you know, uh, CPP, you know, C preprocessor kind of uh, method. So you actually have, uh, you know, definitions inside there and have Apache adjust how it uh, works and responds by keying in on those, uh, on those variable definitions inside the configuration file. And, uh, and finally, some, uh, some other more generic stuff out there. For example, there is a, uh, a much more powerful uh, uh, expression parser, which is used by a number of the configuration directives inside there. It's, uh, it's fully BNF uh, uh, compatible, so if you know that, that grammar, you'll take to it very, very easily. Uh, there is no more name virtual host. They still have name virtual hosts, you know. You can still do, you know, multiple uh, virtual hosts by just using the, the server name. But you're no longer telling Apache, okay, for this particular IP address and or IP address in port, now you need to start worrying about uh, name virtual hosts. It, Apache is smart enough to figure it out just based on the, uh, the, the virtual host tags inside of there. Um, and finally, uh, what's really nice too is that, um, you know, NPMs, which are the multiprocessing modules, have the term modules inside there, but um, they were one of the rare modules that you couldn't, you know, add or subtract, you know, simply by, you know, loading the module in at runtime. Uh, you actually had to build a version of Apache for pre fork for worker and stuff like that. Um, now you're able to do that. So you build uh, all your NPMs at the beginning, you play around with it, you see which, uh, you know, try maybe worker, for example, see if that works fine. If you want to try an event, you would just basically change a single line in your configuration file, no other changes, and now you're using the event NPM. That's very cool. Next, we're going to talk about uh, some of the, uh, the new modules uh, which, are, which are out there. And this one I'm really, really excited about because as you can see, one of my very, very first presentations, this was at ApacheCon uh, 2000, I, I talked about mod macro. Which, um, which is sort of like, you know, CPP on steroids. Um, it, it, it made, at the time, I was running a, um, uh, an ISP, uh, you know, company called Jagunet, and it made my life so much easier to have this kind of uh, capability in here. Well, it wasn't, um, what, maybe a year ago um, that the, uh, the developer actually donated this to, uh, to the ASF. Um, and um, here's just a, a small, you know, uh, config file uh, sample of what we're doing inside here. And you're seeing that basically we're defining a macro that says a vhost has a particular name and domain associated with it. And you're able to then, instead of copying and pasting huge chunks of configuration file, you know, inside there and making things difficult, you're actually able to macronize it inside here. Here's the, what the virtual host container is that is, uh, defines that macro you're doing it, and you're just saying, okay, make one of these, make one of these. And so it's, 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 it's as if Apache itself is doing the cutting and pasting uh, for you. Um, it doesn't make Apache itself uh, run any quicker or run any faster or things like that, but it does make your job much easier, especially when uh, you're looking at diffs between different various versions of config files and stuff like that, seeing a single line change rather than a, you know, a multi-chunk you know, chunk phase and stuff like that. Another thing as well is that just say, for example, you need to change where the document root is. You only need to change it once for your entire selection of, of virtual hosts out there rather than doing a global, you know, search and replace inside the configuration file. Again, uh, as, as, as much easier as you can make uh, life for the sysadmin, especially when things are, uh, you know, changing uh, quite a bit, which as we know, things are, are doing that now, it's, it, it's much better for you. Now, if you would like more information about all these, um, uh, these cool 
uh, you know, runtime configuration changes. Rich actually has a session right after this one, I believe, called uh, configurable uh, configuration in Apache 2.4. And Rich will be able to go into a lot more detail uh, about this. And I really encourage you to, uh, uh, to attend that because I basically just did a, a short little summary of it. In fact, unfortunately, you know, because of the time, I'm only able to do a short little summary of all of these. So I encourage you to just use this as sort of like a, a you know, a glossary or a, 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 an introduction to some of the new features. Um, and if you have any questions, or I encourage you to look at more stuff. Uh, another cool thing is that Mod Lua. I don't know if it, how many people are familiar with the Lua language itself. It's uh, not many, you really should look at it. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's tough because every day there's a new language coming out there right there. And, but the nice thing about Lua is that um, it's really well, it, it, a lot of the reasons why Perl worked so well with the early web is that a lot of the, what Perl did well was very web-like. String, string manipulation and stuff like that. It did it well, it had a lot of libraries associated with it, stuff like that. Well, Lua is sort of, sort of like the same sort of way. It enables you to do things very, very quickly, very, very intuitively, uh, but also do so in a way that um, does not create a very, very bloated, slow language in there. The, uh, it's the ability to, to handle, you know, uh, you know, multi-megabyte, even gigabyte strings very, very easily without scarfing the entire string inside there and stuff like that. Really makes it well suited for uh, a protocol which is still, you know, until, you know, HTTP 2.0, um, uh, still very, very string based and stuff like that. Um, it, it provides a really nice way of, again, uh, writing uh, modules inside of Apache, a la Mod Perl, a la Mod Python, but using Lua itself, and it's very, very fast. It's a very efficient way of creating really, really nice, uh, you know, uh, nice modules out there. It's a fun language to learn and stuff like that. Um, so, if you are interested in, yes. It, it does both. It does both. In fact. Uh, uh, Daniel has a session later on today at 5 p.m. I know it's 5 p.m. And, you know, a lot of people would be like, oh, geez, 5 p.m. You know, there's beer someplace calling me. I got to go. But I'll, I'll be sitting in on it, you know. And so I really encourage you to also go um, and, and sit in on it as well. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, it's, it's still considered semi-experimental, but we're using it. We being the ASF are using it for a bunch of the, uh, the websites that we're running, like the module website, I think, all the comment uh, website that you go to the documentation tree, all the, doc, uh, you know, the comments are being run on there as well. So we use it quite a bit. Um, and so we are, um, you know, we think it's, you know, it, it's ready for prime time. Uh, some other modules that are out there, uh, which are pretty cool. Um, obviously, there's a lot of mod proxy stuff which has been added in, support for fast CGI, SCGI. WTunnel is a WebSocket tunnel, so if you're a front end uh, Apache needs to talk to a WebSockets on the back end, mod proxy WTunnel will do that for you as well. Yes? Yes, yes. Uh, the question was does it do a, uh, an automatic upgrade? You know, just because that's one of the ways it goes from a regular HTTP request to a WebSocket is that, <clears throat> excuse me, it sends an upgrade and says, hey, I'm going to, to WebSockets protocol. And it does that. My proxy, uh, the WTunnel does that for you. Um, um, Mod proxy HTML, uh, which was a sort of like a, uh, a, a uh, it was a third-party module. It was designed to help you rewrite HTML on the fly inside of um, inside of Apache. It was a third-party module. It's now doing it to the ASF. It's part of the, uh, the canonical uh, build of Apache now. Uh, Mod Proxy Express is sort of like uh, virtual hosts for uh, Mod Proxy. Um, the idea being is that you can actually drive, um, you know, uh, proxy pass statements to back-end servers just by having a, a small DB file on the back-end. Um, so instead of having inside of your configuration file a whole bunch of proxy pass slash whatever, you know, if you've got a huge slew of them, um, you can do this by a, by a DB file. Uh, the nice thing about this is that uh, it enables this to be created and updated dynamically. And Apache will, of course, you know, if, it, if, if you're adding a new one at the very, very bottom, you don't need to restart Apache. You don't need to change the configuration file. Apache would just natively and automatically say, oh, 
there's a brand new, you know, uh, you know, server on the back end that I need to worry about. I'll, you know, I'll start doing that. And conversely, you can also remove those as well. Um, it doesn't provide all the flexibility and capability of uh, a proxy pass, but in a lot of cases, when you're just using Apache as a stovepipe to a back end, um, it provides a lot of more flexibility and freedom out there. Um, some other, yes? The question was, do some of those support draining? Not in this particular scenario. Uh, what we will plan on doing is adding the capability to have some of the, uh, the proxy set parameters, you know, things that control what the back end does, like, you know, draining and, and stuff like that, um, uh, on this back end right here. Uh, but, but we don't have that right now. So obviously, if you were to take one away, it doesn't elegantly, you know, remove it from rotation. Uh, and some other modules out there which, uh, which may or may not be, uh, you know, important, but we think they're cool because, again, they provide a, uh, increased performance and flexibility. Uh, mod buffer allows you to actually buffer stuff internally to Apache, which uh, enables you to, you know, especially if you're dealing with a lot of large um, data sets inside your request response uh, by, by buffering it instead of Apache sending out small chunks on the wire as need be. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, performance increases as it comes over the wire. Uh, there was a module called, still does a module called Mod Substitute, which does a uh, regular expression, you know, changing on the fly of uh, response going to the end client. Uh, Mod Sed is a more fuller version of that, which fully supports the, uh, uh, the Sed protocol. So if you need something which has a lot more oomph to it than Mod Substitute would provide to it, Mod Sed is a really, really cool idea. Uh, uh, mod remote IP allows a back end to get the real IP address of the request coming in. Obviously, if, uh, if it's a, a proxy server, the request comes to Apache, Apache goes to the back end server. Well, as far as that back end server is concerned, the client is the Apache front end. And mod remote IP allows that back end server to actually see the real IP of the original client coming in. So as far as the back end server is concerned, you can do different things, you know, if you, if you want to do that, if you want to break that sort of like transparency or if you need to, to have a back end server worry about that. You know, this provides that kind of capability. And if you do want to have a session state, um, you know, there's always a way of doing that, you know, on, you know, the, the Java side, the JavaScript side, the PHP side, and stuff like that. Um, Apache allows you to do that more natively, uh, internally. You can save the session state either inside of Apache on the server side or on the client on the cookie. And there are a whole bunch of other ones out there as well. Okay, and finally, I'd like to talk about the whole idea about cloud and performance. And um, what's, uh, what's new in, in 2.4 are the, uh, the whole... Um, inputs and the feedback from the, uh, from the cloud performance complaint out there. Um, now, some of this stuff may not be totally agreeable by everyone, but really when you look at it, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, first of all, horizontal scaling, adding new servers, you know, in, at, at that layer is no longer as painful, <clears throat> excuse me, as it was. You know, uh, the cloud makes it easier. I mean, that's what the cloud is designed to do. It's not a, uh, you know, a, a networkly available, you know, disk you know, at your house that, you, you know, it, it's designed to be able to allow you to, uh, you know, easily and transparently add and remove resources at, as the load requires. So ho horizontal scaling is not as painful as it was. So again, that's a design driver on what, uh, what's important to Apache, okay? Concurrency is not, no longer the sole consideration, okay? It still is a major consideration, but, um, Knowing that horizontal scaling is so much easier, then maybe concurrency is not the main issue that you need to worry about. Maybe now what you can worry about more is, um, is latency. Maybe what's more important to you is making sure that uh, no matter what requests are coming in, there will be a response sent in in this time frame rather than an unknown or inconsistent time frame out there. Um, and again, this, you know, this enables um, you to rethink what your architecture is and rethink the promises that your web server are making to the, uh, uh, to the, to the end user, to the clients out there. Um, now, density, of course, still matters. You know, you certainly don't want to have, um, you know, a, a one web server which is, works 
fine with you know, one instance in, in a cloud as compared to uh, a web server that requires 100 instances on this, you know, in the same cloud to have it. But um, this enables you to, uh, to really rethink the, the dynamics of, of, of Apache out there and how uh, your cloud architecture can be. So the cloud is a dynamic place. It's changing all the time, and you want to make sure that the, uh, the, the poor sysadmin who has to worry about this doesn't have to worry about it. That Apache itself is smart enough and aware enough to be able to take care of a lot of those uh, the considerations on its own. Uh, so things like you know, automatic, uh, uh, automated reconfiguration is, is very, very important. Uh, again, with the ability of doing horizontal and not so much vertical scaling, how can you change Apache to make the, uh, the, the best uh, case scenarios in, in that way? And, and secondly, to have the environments themselves self-aware, such that when you're adding or removing instances from the web, um, you don't necessarily need to tell the cloud or Apache this is what's going on. Even, and no matter how simple it can be, that the, the environment itself knows that, okay, this, uh, this node has, has sprung up, I'll be aware of it, I will you know, add it into my, my, uh, my cluster set, and I'll go ahead along with it. So you know, in most cases, the reason why uh, this is important to, uh, to Apache, especially 2.4, is because it puts a lot of design drivers on the concept of, of a dynamic uh, reverse proxy for Apache, okay? Um, and the reason why is, as I mentioned earlier before, you know, Apache still is most probably the most heavily used front end uh, web server out there. So all the proxy capabilities that have been in Apache for a long, long period of time need to become much more cloud aware, much more cloud friendly, and need to listen to what those design drivers which are being pulled into the cloud as well. And the front end itself must be, uh, must be dynamic friendly. You know, if, uh, if your, your answer to, oh, we're adding, uh, you know, a new, new, new node or we're changing the backend node configuration is change the configuration file and do a grace or restart, that's crap. Nobody's going to want to do that. You want to make that as easy as possible. And so that dynamic capability needs to be internal to Apache itself. So some of the new features of, of, a side, uh, of Apache 2.4 with this in mind um, as, as I said before, is the capability of to have a whole bunch of different uh, backends out there. So you might be talking, uh, you know, HTTP on the front end, but the backend allows you to talk a lot of different protocols, you know, out, outside there as well. Uh, we added a whole bunch of new uh, load balancing mechanisms, so you can balance by, you know, either traffic or the amount of bytes going back and forth, or, there, or, or other dynamic uh, things. Um, you know, some of this stuff is, is stuff I talked about uh, earlier before, my product express was that dynamic thing. Uh, another cool thing is that uh, not only do we have fast CGI as a proxy module, you can also use it as, an ex, uh, as a you know, self-contained uh, module itself. So it's, it's not really part of mod proxy or the mod proxy family, but it basically provides proxy and capability on the back end to a, a fast CGI server on the back end. And we actually have a, a tool, uh, you know, fast CGI starter, which actually starts those, uh, those fast CGI processes for you. And something else, which was just added, it's just in the latest version of, of, uh, of Apache um, for Mod Proxy, is the support for, uh, for backend Unix domain sockets. You know, so nowadays, um, obviously, you know, if you're having, you know, things running on the, on the same server, the same instance, you know, the communication is much quicker, much quicker uh, using a UDS rather than over a normal traditional TCP IP socket, even if the socket is, is localhost, for example. So uh, here's a quick little, uh, you know, summary, sort of like all these ideas, uh, you know, combined into one. Uh, we're creating... A, a balancer, which is uh, Apache speak for a cluster or a collection of, of nodes. Those nodes are actually called balancer members or sometimes just members. So we're seeing we're creating two, uh, two balancers um, or clusters, one which is uh, worrying about, um, you know, transferring uh, HTTP requests uh, to the back end, um, those probably PHP servers. Um, the second one worrying about uh, Java requests, we're talking uh, the HAP protocol which is the protocol that, um, you know, uh, Tomcat uses on the back end. So anything that's coming in for, you know, blah, 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 slash flu uh, will be sent to some of these uh, 
uh, nodes right back here. Uh, this backup is, is a hot standby, which is what that plus one be. So basically, it'll be circulating between these two nodes right here, balancing by traffic, which is the amount of, 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 uh, of bytes in and out. Um, if one of these uh, goes away, then this one will take the rest of the traffic. If, uh, if uh, both of those go away, then this backup server will then take up the load. Um, should one of these come back up, then of course Apache would natively uh, recover from that. Yes? Can Love Talk be expressed once Love Talk is out? Yes. Yes, it can. Okay. Yes? Yes. The question was, are there health checks on the back end? And there are. Uh, um, it is configurable about how long you want to wait for it to, uh, to error out and how you circulate what those health checks are and things like that. And the health checks are, are um, somewhat specific to the protocol that you're talking on the back end. For example, AJP has a very, very simple, lightweight CPing Sing Pong check, which, which is very, very nice. For, for HTTP, uh, the best you can do is what's called an options. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the HTTP methods out there, and that's what it does. But it is configurable, and there are health checks. Um, and Apache is smart enough to actually before, if you want to, before you send a request, do a health check. Do a quick health check, then send the request to it. Or you can just say, just send the request, you know, to the back end node, and if no node responds, then take that out of circulation and do something else. That is all, all configurable. Um, and so, you know, what we're seeing right here is, the, is basically the magic of saying anything for slash apps goes to that balancer, anything for slash serve goes right there, and anything coming for slash foo is actually going to this, um, this WebSocket, which, <clears throat> which uh, lives on home, www.socket. What was that? Yeah, oh, okay. Um, yeah, let me. Uh, yeah, um, uh, basically the idea that anything that comes in for slash foo will be uh, handled by a HTTP, a web server, that's listening on this local socket on the server that this version of Apache is running on. So the HTTP says it's going to be talking, uh, you know, HTTP. This says where the Unix domain socket is, um, and this basically says if there's any URL that you want to add or append to the request that's coming in, um, that'll be done. Actually, um, there's a, a presentation later on today that I've got a slide about that I'll go into a lot more detail about that. I, I just wanted to give a quick, uh, a quick summary of some of the things out there. Um, uh, mod heartbeat and ha mod heart monitor are multicast methods that basically also provide sort of like a heartbeat are you there signal to the back end nodes um, to allow you to again dynamically add or subtract back end nodes out there. Uh, of course, multicast is an issue, especially in the cloud. It's really not uh, not supported almost anywhere at all. Um, but the idea, the concept itself is very, very good. And I know I mentioned this earlier, and, and unfortunately it hasn't gained a lot of traffic yet, but there really needs to be some universally accepted way of back-end web servers um, to indicate to front ends what their loading is. Okay, so it would be nice to have this universal method that says, and it could be anything at all, that basically says, I'm available to do uh, 10 times work, I'm available to do one times work, or something like that. Um, because obviously most of the, uh, the load balancing mechanisms that are in use are from the front end, and, and they're looking at and making estimates as far as what the back end is capable of, of, of doing, what kind of workload the back end is, is capable of, of accepting. Uh, it'd be nice to be able to have a universal way for the back end to say, this is how much load I can, I can take. Um, and the easy way of doing that would be to send um, you know, that kind of information in a, you know, in a response header that the, that the proxy server grabs and then, you know, stores internally as well. Um, so we really need some sort of, you know, way of, of, of doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Right. 
Right. My cluster, uh, which is uh, with, uh, with, with uh, you know, the JBoss, you know, application server um, and HDB on the front end provides that sort of like, you know, load balancing mechanism. So it provides, you know, that, uh, that back end knowledge, you know, back up to it. Um, and uh, another cool thing too um, is that there is an, uh, a built-in balancer manager out there that allows you to change all different kinds of things, um, including uh, adding new backend uh, servers. This is a, a web, let me see if I can actually, I know we only have about three minutes to go. So if I can, yeah, I'm not going to try. Anyway, the whole idea behind this is that it is a, um, uh, a um, administration uh, panel, and I'm sure it'll be talked about in the uh, in the uh, presentation later on today, which provides not only a view of what your proxy server is doing, you know, what the backend nodes are and things like that, and whether it's up or alive, uh, you know, the amount of traffic it's seeing and stuff like that, but allows you to change those parameters. So you can say, for example, for this cluster, I want to change the load balancing mechanism. You select a new load balancing mechanism, you hit apply, and like that, the, the proxy server will change. No need to change the configuration file, no need to reset or restart Apache, it does it in, in real time. Um, and because it's, it, it, it's, it's restfully driven, even though we, we uh, normally access it through this web administrator, you know, this, uh, this online form, you can actually just send HTTP requests with the correct information inside there to add, subtract, you know, change parameters and stuff like that. Uh, some of the cool things about it is that it is dynamic, so if you want to, if you, if you, you know, shut down Apache and start it back up again, it will start up with all the changes that you just applied, irregardless if you put those inside of the, the configuration file or not. So, um, you know, provides a lot of really, really cool information out there and allows you to, again, dynamically change without losing any kind of information. Now, there is a, um, uh, you know, two uh, very, really cool um, sessions that you should definitely sit in on. Uh, you know, Daniel's doing the Mod Proxy Cookbook today at three. I really, really encourage you to go there because, um, you know, for me, Mod Proxy is like sort of like the cloud changer for, for Apache. It's one of the really, really cool parts. And, and Jeff's doing a talk tomorrow uh, specifically about fast CGI in Apache 2.4. So if any of this stuff interests you, and I hope it does, uh, uh, definitely encourage you guys to, to go and sit on all these. Um, I think that is it. We might have time for maybe like one or two questions. Um, if you need to contact me, this is my contact information. As I mentioned before, uh, the slides will be on SlideShare sometime later on today. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, I hope you had at least a, a, a smattering of some information and really encourage you to take a, a look at 2.4. And again, um, you know, we are purely, you know, the community feedback is incredibly important. Um, and so if you have any suggestions, improvements, code patches, send them to the dev list and we'll fold them in because that's, you know, that's the, that is the lifeblood of, of Apache HTTPD. So, thank you. Uh, we are now open for questions. Uh, I'll have the first question, being the moderator. Uh, so, uh, I, you just explained that you use skip lists with NPM. So uh, could you explain what, what went through uh, selection, selecting skip list over other search stru structures? Oh, oh, um, the, the, oh, well, I don't need to request. Uh, the, uh, the data structure itself, is, is we're using skip list inside of the event PM. So it's not really an NPM specifically using you know, skip list. Uh, the idea behind it is that the way the queue is set up, you need to be able to insert, because you're, the queue is set up by, by keep alive. How long do you wait until uh, you, know, you want to take this, uh, the socket out of the queue to worry about, okay? Um, and so since you're having keep alive requests coming in with their own particular time frame, as well as new requests which are coming in that you want to keep open, um, that's an, un, you know, the, uh, you, you just can't append it to the beginning or the end of that queue. You need to insert it in the correct place inside the queue. And the skip list is a great, uh, you know, great method of finding where you are in that thing and inserting or removing something. It's a very efficient um, uh, data structure for removing stuff which is somewhat ordered um, and finding out exactly where to insert or remove something inside of it. Any other questions? No, well, thank you again for attending. I hope you guys have a fantastic uh, three days of ApacheCon, um, and enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>